It gives me great so. pleasure uh, this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Kara Polin. Those who have been veterans of our lecture series are well familiar with her work and uh, the expertise that she has graciously uh, uh, agreed to share with us this morning. For the fellows, this is really critical to the work that you do. Uh, and so I would uh, encourage you to um, be taking some notes while you're doing this. Uh, we'll have opportunities for Q&A, and there's always a, a lot of uh, rich information uh, that might uh, result in some conversation or, or feedback. So um, uh, with that, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Poland, and looking forward to your talk this morning. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, I'm Kara Poland. I am a board certified and fellowship trained addiction medicine specialist um, here in Grand Rapids. I am um, employed by MSU and then contracted back for part of my time to Trinity Health and part of my time to Corwell Health. Health. So I tell people that I am hospital agnostic in the region um, by virtue of being MSU employed. Um, but I do. We do now have a fellowship at Trinity Health um, for addiction medicine, and uh, for those of you that know uh, Paul Trowbridge, um, he runs the recovery center at uh, Trinity Health West Michigan. Uh, he is uh, the associate program director, and I'm the program director. We're excited because we are going to have a fellow next year, and hoping to um, work with the fellowships. Uh, the um, work together as fellowships which across hospice um, and palliative medicine, as well as addiction medicine to see how we can um, bring fellows together because misery loves company, um, and but also maybe synergize some of the uh, discussions that we can have with each other. So excited for that potential in the future as well. Um, I know it said I had 77 slides for anybody who is like a recovering internist like I am. Um, but I, it's actually both lectures. So as Dr. Mulder said, please feel free to um, pause me, ask questions, put questions in the chat. I will try to keep the meeting chat open. Uh, so I see as those come in, but because of the CMA login requirements, if I miss something, feel free to pause me, interrupt me, whatever's most com comfortable for you. And then I will um, also leave uh, time at the end for, for a discussion. So we're going to talk a little bit about the neurobiology of addiction, um, but don't worry, we're not going to go into a lot of super detail. I just want to get kind of a baseline understanding. This is kind of a standard piece that I do every year for the fellowship. So if you've seen me speak before, my apologies if it's a little bit repetitive. Um, so here is the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine definition of addiction. I think the most important part of it are the first seven words. Addiction is a treatable, chronic medical disease. Um, a lot of times we look at addiction not as either not treatable or not chronic or a little bit of both. Um, we know that uh, when we provide people with evidence-based treatment, uh, they, that recovery is real. We see actual changes in the brain structures um, in a person who's in long-term sustained treatment uh, compared to somebody who is not. And we see changes in those brain structures that results in kind of that phenotypic change of behavior uh, that is a result of the medical illness. Um, prevention efforts are for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. Um, so when thinking about it through a palliative care lens, um, really having those conversations with your patients about sort of the um, power of these medications, the power of opioids um, is, is, is important. I mean, we don't, we certainly don't want anybody to be um, uncomfortable at the end of life by having those conversations also with family members, um, because one of the, um, one, of, one of the challenges we often have is how do people dispose of these medications? Um, how do family members dispose of these medications uh, afterward? And that can be uh, that can be a big challenge. Um, and so we, uh, and so there are many times that that is a vulnerable time period for a family member where they're at higher risk for developing a substance use disorder uh, because of that grief and loss that comes with, um, comes with death. And so we wanna make sure that uh, we have that pre those prevention efforts in place for the families, uh, family members who are affected as well. 
So addiction just has characteristic signs and symptoms. Um, and so that this is just to show that we can really define addiction um, and, and diagnose it using kind of evidence using the evidence-based practices. So this is the diagnostic criteria um, for uh, substance use disorder. I, it should just say substance use, I'm sorry. It takes says tobacco at the top, um, but it, it really is uh, the, these 11 diagnostic criteria are consistent across all substances, so that doesn't really matter. Um, the, the part that I always wanna point out to folks is these two pharmacology ones. Um, tolerance and withdrawal are not um, alone are not diagnostic of a substance use disorder, right? Any of your patients um, that are on opioids for an extended period of time. And by extended period of time, people can be tolerant to these medications in as little as seven days. Um, so if you have somebody who is developing tolerance um, pretty quickly, uh, that can be expected. People are, often don't realize that it can happen kind of that quickly. Um, but those two alone uh, don't diagnose a substance use disorder because, you know, anybody who's taking opioids for a prolonged period of time uh, will develop tolerance and withdrawal. So they have to have some form of uh, brain disease uh, that is impairing their control, resulting in social impairment or resulting in risky use. This is just a, a comparison of recurrence rates between substance use disorders in the purple here and other um, chronic illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. And I just show this to kind of instill in you the fact that this that, that substance use disorders kind of cross the confidence intervals for all of the other um, for all of these other chronic illnesses, just underscoring the fact that this is a treatable disease. If we treat it as a chronic illness, people can be successful. Not everyone is going to be successful, and we can expect it not to be perfect. I don't know about you all, but I have done things to try to improve my health, right? Whether that's getting, well, you know, those lifestyle, getting out those lifestyle changes, whether that's changing my diet, changing my activity level, changing something about what I'm consuming or doing to improve my health. And, and uh, the one I always go back to is I'm a Diet Coke drinker. That is my substance of misuse. Um, family lore is that I ordered my first Diet Coke at a restaurant when I was two, um, much to the embarrassment of my parents. Um, it's their fault. They're the ones that drank all the Diet Coke. Um, anyway, so when I was trying to get pregnant, when I was pregnant, breastfeeding, I had like the six year period that I was trying to conceive pregnant or breastfeeding with my two children. Um, and uh, I didn't drink Diet Coke because, you know, I was concerned about the artificial sweeteners and the caffeine. I mean, I didn't eat chocolate because I was concerned about any caffeine intake. Um, I went a little overboard, uh, admittedly. But like the day I stopped breastfeeding, I can still like feel the cold Diet Coke in my hand that I had, right? Um, and and so that even though I had but not had that kind of unhealthy uh, lifestyle choice for a prolonged period of time, I was ready to get right back into it. And for somebody with a substance use disorder, um, those types of things can happen, to, you know, that, that can happen to them, not necessarily that they feel they want to start using again, but they get exposed to the right environment, um, the right set of circumstances, um, and, and that can put them at risk. Um, and sometimes that can, you know, cl classically, we hear, we hear about it uh, with cocaine um, that, you know, you can go 20 years without using and then you drive by a location that you used to regularly use um, and you and you somehow manage to pull over and you don't even really know what exactly happened there. So these are the main areas of the brain that are affected by substance use disorder. So the basal ganglia um, is the desire or was where desire or the want to use originates. Um, I, I talk about it as a gas tank for motivation. Um, and then the extended amygdala is where our emotional response and memory lie. It also um, is a contributor to mediating our pain response. Um, and, and then the prefrontal cortex is sort of the CEO of the brain. Um, it's responsible for self-regulation. It's kind of the brakes um, and says, you know, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that right now or in this place or at, at this time. Um, uh, what we see in terms of our drive chemical, which is um, 
uh, which is dopamine. Dopamine is not our pleasure chemical. Our pleasure chemical is opioid. Um, so op so uh, beta endorphins are, are what cause pleasure and that is chemically an opioid. Um, so uh, what we see with substances of misuse is kind of here is your baseline drive uh, to do good, to have good feelings. Um, and this is sort of your best day ever. This is the, you know, the pinnacle of life. Um, and uh, this is kind of what happens in terms of drive to repeat that day, to repeat that event when you use marijuana, heroin, and methamphetamine. So I, I can't compete with that, right? I tell people there is nothing that I can do that will make you feel like that first time you used meth. There's nothing in life that will ever make you feel that way again. Um, because the drive to do it again won't won't exist to make you want that feeling. Um, and so I usually, I'm going to skip this. Um, so our body kind of unconsciously uh, responds to different stimuli. So this is, um, this is why when somebody uses, um, uh, when somebody uses, uh, it gets ready to use when they start getting out their accoutrements of use, their cooker, their syringes, um, when they start rolling that joint, they actually exit withdrawal for a brief period of time. Um, and we see this uh, very prominently in alcohol use where they'll um, start having, they'll wake up in the morning, they haven't used for you know six or eight hours and they actually are physically shaking. Yet when they go to pour the alcohol, they stop shaking and they can get that cup to their mouth and, um, and because their body kind of goes out of withdrawal and anticipation. Um, it doesn't last forever. It only lasts for a few minutes, and then they will go back into withdrawal um, if they don't get their if they don't um, get the substance. Um, I mentioned that you can kind of see some of these brain changes. I was kind of priming you for this slide. Uh, this is a control patient uh, that does not have cocaine use. These are old NIDA slides. Uh, these are fMRIs. I'm sure you probably realize that, but just in case, these are fMRIs. Um, and so again, with that, we have the red to uh, purple color spectrum. Um, red is more active, the darker blues and purples are less active brain tissue. Uh, and so you can see that the frontal cortex and the control patient is closer to the red end of the spectrum than that of the person who has a cocaine use disorder. I use this to point out that like their brain is just not functioning as well as it could optimally be. So sometimes when we tell people with a substance use disorder, hey, maybe you should cut back. Hey, maybe you should stop. Hey, maybe you should do these other healthy things for, for you. Maybe we should try to affect some of the social determinants of health. How many job applications did you fill out? When, you know, have you gone to the housing authority? Um, when we try to ask people some of those questions, they might not actually be able to truly process it and break it down into the steps, right? Because their frontal cortex, their CEO of the brain, it is not able to function as well as in somebody who is, does not have an active substance use disorder. So sometimes we really do need to sort of break those things down into smaller steps and help them to help them better um, understand what uh, you know what the processes that they that they may need to go through um, in order to. I mean, even things like picking up prescriptions. Um, you know, making sure that they know which pharmacy to go to, making sure that they um, that that they you kind of know uh, behaviors, uh, behavior patterns in a pharmacy and what to expect. Um, and same thing in your clinic. Um, people with a substance use disorder in specialty substance use disorder clinics rarely have any behavior issues. I, I don't even remember the last time I had a behavior issue with a patient. I think it was like four or five years ago. Um, and that's because by the time they come to see the addiction person, like they know they're gonna get help. Whereas in a lot of um, areas of medicine, um, we, we don't provide supportive environments for people with substance use disorders. Um, we can be very judgmental and um, a lot of stigma comes out. Uh, and so they don't, they, they appropriately don't feel safe in that environment. Um, and so then their behaviors reflect you know, reflect that lack of safety. Um, this is also a very high trauma population. Um, the uh, if we look at ACE scores, um, kids who have an a so adults who have had an ACE score of four or above have a twelve time increased risk 
of a substance use disorder. So we tend to see that there is also um, longitudinal uh, developmental trauma that occurs with this patient population, as well as um, as well as uh, um, um, intergenerational trauma. Um, we know that there's a genetic component of substance use disorder. So if um, so, if we have that kind of gene, if we have that compilation of genes in our brains, um, that can lead to uh, increased risk for a substance use disorder. We also know that um, what happens during pregnancy in terms of epigenetics with alcohol um, can increase the risk of uh, children of a person who drinks alcohol during their pregnancy um, having an alcohol use disorder. We don't have the same data um, for other substances of misuse. We don't know yet. It's not that we have not proven that it doesn't happen, but we don't know yet. Um, so again, why do some people become, you know, why do some people become addicted to drugs and others don't? Um, there's an environmental influence, right? If you're not, uh, if you're not exposed to substances, you're not going to develop a substance use disorder, right? There's those, again, those adverse childhood experiences um, where you grew up, what is available for, to you in your community, uh, who you, who your peers are. Um, and I don't know about you all, but please don't blame me for, you know, the friends that I had when I was 12. I, I don't know that, like, that would be great now that I'm in my 40s, right? Um, developmental, you know, we mentioned, uh, we mentioned that epigenetics can play a, can play a role, but we also definitely see uh, gray matter changes. Uh, we also know that, you know, that that uh, the average age of first use is about 12 years old. I, I have my child, my youngest is turning 10 today. Happy birthday, Eleanor. And my oldest is turning 12 um, at the end of this month. So I have an average age of first use and I look at that child and I'm like, what? How is that even possible? He just seems still so young. Um, but what we know is that a 12 year old who uses marijuana, it's not a gateway drug in the way that we, uh, you know, sort of used to think about it, that if at age, you know, if at age, you know, 12 or 13, you use marijuana by 16, you'll be using cocaine and by 18, you'll be injecting heroin. It's not that it's that using um, using marijuana or any other substance as an adolescent is a marker of a risk-taking behavior. So an adolescent who uses substances is uh, who takes the risk of using, you know, marijuana, smoking a cigarette, uh, getting into mom and dad's alcohol, being given mom and dad's alcohol, um, is showing a risk-taking behavior and a and in the case of parental support of that, a family dynamic, so an environmental piece as well, so we're kind of in this lane, um, that uh, increases their risk of a lifetime substance use disorder. Part of the reason um, that the legal drinking age was raised to 21 is because if your brain is not exposed to alcohol prior to age 21, we actually see a cliff where you have a significantly decreased risk of a lifetime development of a substance use disorder. So the permissiveness that we see around alcohol in, in adolescents, particularly in late adolescents, as we enter undergraduate um, school, graduate from high school, um, and enter the workforce in, in some cases, uh, really shows, uh, re really is a, uh, is a, significant risk for our communities around developing an alcohol use disorder. If we could delay that until 21, we would be much, uh, we would be much better off. And then you're going to say to me, but in Europe, um, so Europe doesn't have lower rates of alcohol use disorders. Um, so I, I, yes, they start drinking earlier. Um, they don't have nearly as big of a binge culture as we do um, in, in later adolescence. Um, so that, uh, you know, that it, it seems to sort of balance out. So giving your uh, teenager alcohol, um, you know, with dinner under supervision is, uh, is just simply not protective. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the biological, um, biological changes that can, uh, that can, re that can just, uh, increase risk for a substance use disorder. Um, so, when we see people in an opioid withdrawal, um, you know, it can begin, it can begin in as little as 12 hours after last opioid use with some of our faster acting 
opioids and peaks at around three to five days. It lasts approximately one to four weeks. Um, but I think it's really important that I point out this post acute withdrawal because I know, you know, I know you also, um, you guys also treat patients who um, need kind of that uh, cancer pain management that go into cancer remission and then you're trying to stop the opioids. Um, and one thing that I think we don't pay a lot of attention to is this post-acute withdrawal, um, which can last up to a couple of years. Um, and so it can, it can, and, and if you, you know, if you kind of think about what opioid withdrawal feels like, it sort of feels like the worst flu of your life or the worst cold of your life. I used to always say flu. Maybe I should say when you had COVID the first time or something. Um, but when you were really quite ill with a viral infection. Um, and, and what do you want to do when you're quite ill with a viral infection? Why you want to go to sleep. You want to rest. You want to, um, you want to be in kind of a dark, quiet room and, and curl up into a ball, right? Um, the problem with opioid withdrawal is that you also have really bad insomnia. Um, so even though, so, so the one thing that you want to do, which is rest to feel better, you can't do. And guess what? You know exactly what's going to make that go away. That's like you having a really bad flu. And having you know bright lights in your room, people not letting you fall asleep, and then keep and then preventing you from taking you know anything like Motrin or Tylenol, sounds pretty miserable to me. Um, and that's kind of what acute withdrawal uh, looks like. Uh, post acute withdrawal, um, I'm sure you've already read it, but it includes a lot of um, mental health things that, especially in a population like you guys serve. Uh, could contribute to uh, worsening mental health as well. Um, and and it can because it can last up to two years, it's often kind of underdiagnosed um, as a result of that. Uh, and and uh, and so it's just something that I wanted to make sure was kind of elevated onto your radars uh, so that you would um, maybe have some, you know, maybe maybe have uh, think about how this may be affecting. Um, your patients in the longer um, that that are uh, uh, that are tapered off of opioids at some point. So addiction essentially hijacks those brain structures. That frontal lobe can't work. It's unable to stop the information flow and kind of those immature um, reptilian areas of the brain sort of take over. Um, and and uh, because the frontal cortex is not fully developed when we are 12 and 13 years old, which is kind of the common ages of uh, onset of use, it remains underdeveloped. So when we see somebody who's, in, who's older, um, you know, when we see a patient that is, uh, you know, a geriatric patient that has a substance use disorder, they can often display kind of almost an inability to make appropriate um, uh, to, to comprehend and have those kind of higher uh, brain functions. And that can sometimes just uh, be expected. So I wanted to make sure we pointed that out. Um, I don't think that this is anything that you all don't know, um, but when we look at the relative potency of opioids, we really see that fentanyl has um, very much changed the landscape. Uh, this, the preliminary CDC data from 2000, from uh, last year, 2023, um, show that Michigan is slated to have about a 2% increase in opioid overdose deaths, so for a total of just over 3,000 people. And I just want to point out that when we talk about opioid overdose deaths, um, I tell people all the time, that's like saying the only death from hypertension we're going to count in our statistics are those deaths that are from um, that are that are from acute MIs. We're not going to count the person that has stroke. We're not going to count the person that has um, renal failure. We're only going to count one singular cause of death and and report that out as the effect of hypertension on our community. No one would let us do that. That sounds that sounds like not very smart. Um, but that is what we do with opioids because the only thing that we tend to focus on is that opioid overdose death. We don't talk about the person who dies of bacterial endocarditis. We don't talk about the person that dies of um, that dies of HIV complications related to in injection. You know, related to injection drug use. Um, we don't talk about these other causes of that, um, uh, other causes that result in opioid mortality. Um, I think it's important to also note here that 
um, and we'll talk about this more next week, is that Michigan is slated to receive $1.5 billion in opioid remediation funding from the manufacturers, distributors, and developers of opioids. But this money is not just for substance use disorder. It is, um, it is and it's not just for opioids. It can be used for opioid substance use disorder, um, opioid risk mitigation strategies, and um, mental health. So it could potentially be um, a source of funding and training uh, for training or for other support services um, more broadly in the palliative care space as well. Um, so here is what, uh, this is a little bit older because um, it doesn't extend quite out because it's all preliminary data. The finalized data hasn't come out, so it doesn't go out far. Um, but Michigan, you can see, is either above or right around with uh, the, uh, the national average for overdose deaths. Um, so 73.8% of overdose deaths in Michigan involve synthetic opioids, a very small percentage involved heroin. So even though colloquially here in Michigan, we still talk about it as heroin, it's not really heroin. It's um, synthetic opioids, which is driven by um, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Um, here it is broken down by race and ethnicity. Um, it's important to note that um, we do have disproportionately impacted uh, communities in our black and in our indigenous populations. Um, and so part of uh, part of the work that we need to do is to reduce those health disparities um, and support safe, equitable evidence-based treatment for all people in Michigan. Um, alcohol use disorder is um, and al alcohol overconsumption is probably something that I would um, want you all to be considering and thinking about when you see patients um, because and 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 their families. Um, because it is very readily available. Um, it has been, it is becoming more and more destigmatized when we look at things like um, perceived risk of alcohol um, consumption. Those, the, the uh, perceived risk is going down, down, down in our adolescent population. Um, and, and, uh, at, and we see that as a reflection of what we see in adults. Um, we, we, we currently are in a culture where um, you know, even uh, I treat mostly pregnant people, and even in that population, uh, you know, there is no known safe amount of alcohol during pregnancy. And I will have patients that, you know, I, I, not even just in substance use, but there are patients um, across the board, um, particularly more common in upper class white populations that will come in and tell you that, you know, they had a, they had a half a glass of wine last night. Um, and and uh, kind of think that that's uh, not risky, you know, later in the pregnancy, that the only risk of alcohol use is early in the pregnancy. However, there is no known safe amount of alcohol consumption in pregnancy. Um, so as we've seen alcohol uh, become less stigmatized um, and per the perception of it as being less risky, we have seen um, a lot more um, substance use. Um, also important to kind of consider what's going on in that household um, beyond the person that you are treating. Um, so there's an assumption that the number of people in palliative care uh, with a substance use disorder reflect the greater population prevalence of a substance use disorder. Um, but most of our studies, um, one, they focus on just cancer patients, and I found they were pretty outdated. Um, I was I made this slide for you guys. This is a brand new little addition. Um, and, uh, but we did have kind of a national survey that came out uh, around caring for patients with opioid misuse or substance use disorders in hospice. Um, and it, it seemed like it was uh, a little bit more prevalent than uh, maybe, uh, the, maybe the general assumption was. Um, a lot of people were uncomfortable prescribing the medications to treat a substance use disorder, which is very common across um, across all specialties. Um, there's been a the ACGME now requires both family medicine and internal medicine to um, have some amount of substance use disorder education and training. It varies very it varies broadly uh, between different programs. The uh, my my. Uh, Anecdotally, if, um, across Michigan, I work uh, with over 20 
um, resident, I am in FM residencies every year. And anecdotally in this, at least in our state, um, it is definitely more family medicine residencies than um, internal medicine residencies that are actually uh, prescribing medications to treat a substance use disorder from their residency clinics. A little bit more um, is now happening with alcohol. Um, I think it's a perceived as lower threshold. Um, it used to be that you had to get a special waiver um, on your DEA license to be able to prescribe um, buprenorphine to treat um, an opioid use disorder. However, um, that waiver was eliminated about a little over a year ago. It was eliminated on January 12th of 2023 for anyone who really wanted that detail. Um, it was my husband's birthday, so it's an easy date for me to remember. Um, but uh, so now anyone can prescribe buprenorphine to treat an opioid use disorder that has an um, that has an unrestricted uh, DEA license, you know, uh, DEA controlled substance prescribing license. Um, and I think it's also just important to note that not necessarily an alcohol use disorder, but again, reflective of that increased sort of perceived safety of alcohol. Alcohol misuse affects up to 28% of palliative care inpatients. Um, I, I didn't find data on outpatient numbers, but I thought that was pretty remarkable when I was trying to find um, information about this intersectionality. So I think as I start my fellowship and you all continue your fellowships, look at this whole new area of research. Um, to our to our knowledge, um, Dr. Mulder and, and mine, so uh, maybe, maybe there is, uh, but to our knowledge, uh, we looked around at the different fellowships across the nation. We are the only place that is purposefully trying to integrate that addiction and, subs and palliative care um, fellowships together because uh, we were trying to find if there were you know models for doing this or places to start other than our own brains. Um, so that's pretty a pretty exciting opportunity for us to um, make sure that uh, make sure that you all get great experiences. Um, across the board and are able to better care for your patients with an understanding of kind of the other side of the coin or the other side of the aisle. Um, so let's talk about some of those FDA approved medications. Um, so we have, oh, so uh, there's there was a private message that came to me asking about uh, hesitancy and calling it alcohol addiction and um, and and why are we kind of switching our terminology to alcohol use disorder um, and that is largely uh, because when we we used to refer to it as um, we used to refer to it as alcohol abuse and when we talk about alcohol abuse uh, people who abuse things are just bad people um, so spousal abuse child abuse animal abuse, elder abuse, those are bad people who are doing bad things. My patients aren't bad people, they have a bad disease. Um, so we changed the terminology to uh, alcohol use disorder in, um, in order to reduce our unconscious bias as well. Um, so they've actually done a study where they took providers and they gave them cases and they said, how would you treat this patient? Um, and the difference between the case was alcohol abuse and alcohol use disorder and people who treated addiction. So people who didn't want to stigmatize their patients that wanted to be working with this population actually applied, provided higher quality, more evidence-based treatment to the person with a um, alcohol use disorder or with a substance use disorder compared to the person with a substance abuse. Um, so uh, we also know that that stigma kind of permeates into other areas of our um, of our world, right? So there is self-stigma, there is the stigma that I just talked about, stigma from the healthcare system, stigma from the recovery community, and then stigma from uh, the broader community. And so by just elevating our, our um, the words that we use, the conversations that we have, we actually reduce our unconscious bias, provide higher quality evidence-based care, and it doesn't cost a dime and it doesn't even take any time. Um, so diamond time, I know, isn't that cute? Uh, you can see I've done that before. Uh, so that is why we uh, kind of elevate that language. I think that comes up a little bit more later in the talk too, but I will um, be able to just skip through some of those slides. Uh, so some, of, so just uh, I'm sure you all are have now read the slide, but antagonist versus a partial agonist and a full agonist. We have one of each in the treatment of substance use disorder. So methadone is that full agonist. It binds to that receptor, turns the receptor on. I don't know at this point how much you all are using methadone, but I know your primary care colleagues have really uh, mostly stopped using this for chronic pain. 
Um, but what the kind of the difference uh, between methadone for uh, for substance use disorder and methadone for pain is we prescribe uh, one much higher doses in addiction, and two, it is a uh, usually a single daily dose, although uh, twice daily dosing for um, fast metabolizers, uh, pregnant people or people who are disproportionately affected by that higher dose. So somebody who comes in and says, "I just get really exhausted when you give, when I take that full that full dose, and I'm not even able to function," can sometimes be placed on split dosing. And then buprenorphine, um, the trade names for that are Suboxone. Lots of people have heard it uh, referred to by that, so I throw that in there. Um, even though it's a CME thing, don't fire me, please. Um, but buprenorphine is a partial agonist, so it generates that kind of limited effect, um, and it has that ceiling effect. So in somebody who is opioid tolerant, they cannot overdose. That does not mean that I could not overdose as somebody who is not opioid tolerant. If I took the doses of medication I prescribe every day, I would overdose and die. Um, but my patients are opioid tolerant, so they don't. Um, but it does have a ceiling effect, which uh, which is helpful in terms of uh, overdose risk for people who are taking it. It does ha also have a very uh, quite a high affinity, although it uh, can be overcome with uh, with fentanyl, who ha that has a more similar affinity. Um, before when it was still heroin on the streets and it wasn't fentanyl. Uh, we used to really press people to use fentanyl in the hospital for somebody who's on buprenorphine that has kind of a need for acute pain management because it's the best one to be able to uh, cross-react and provide some analgesic effect uh, due to it's also high affinity for that receptor. Uh, it's changed landscape has made this a little bit more challenging. And then naltrexone is an antagonist that blocks the effect. I want to point out that the only two uh, treatments that have proven uh, that are proven to reduce the outcome of death are methadone and buprenorphine. Um, naltrexone in the study did not have adequate numbers for power, um, but so we don't know about, about that, but abstinence-based programming um, or required counseling along with one of these medications does not improve the um, risk of death. So uh, methadone and buprenorphine, getting people medication is what we need to, is what we need to do. Uh, when we look at alcohol use disorder, we have three medications that are FDA approved for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Um, many other medications are often prescribed um, off label. I don't remember. Okay, I did not. I took out the slides. Um, so disulfiram like really doesn't work. That's the, I, again trade name. I'm sorry, but people know it by this. That's antabuse. It is on like every um, medical licensing exam known to man. Um, however, it does not. Um, it does not work. Um, it only has about a 9% success rate. Uh, it is the one that blocks the um, um, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase in the liver and it causes the acetaldehyde uh, to build up, which is the toxic component that makes you kind of get nauseous and vomit and have the red face and flushing uh, when you consume alcohol. Um, the problem is, is that if I decide I wanna drink on Friday, I don't take my medication on uh, for about 48 to 72 hours before. So I just don't take it Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then I can drink no problem. Um, so the way this works best is with directly observed therapy, but we don't, um, we don't, we don't ever really do that. So uh, disulfiram, you can just take it off um, and you don't have to worry about it um, other than for like testing purposes, though I, I don't think it would show up on palliative care, like board exams, but um, anybody who's still maintaining uh, their primary boards or needs to take their primary boards, that does show up, that is a favorite on board exams. Um, naltrexone and acamprosate are the other two FDA approved medications. Naltrexone um, is, an, is, is the same naltrexone as above because I'm an addiction doctor. So the only reason I'm a specialist is because I know the difference between naltrexone and naloxone, the opioid reversal medication. I didn't include a discussion of naloxone because I assume you are all familiar with that um, medication. But if I need to add it in for next year, let me know. Uh, naltrexone is, um, that opioid antagonist, so it cannot be used in somebody who may have another reason to need opioids, which I think may be pretty common for your population. Um, it also cannot be used if the liver enzymes are greater than five times normal. Um, a campus, it is, it does come in in once a month injectable as well as an oral medication uh, that is taken once daily. A campersate is a three times a day medication. So from a compliance standpoint, I, uh, uh, naltrexone is just easier, um, but it, uh, a campersate uh, is excreted by the kidney. So it can be used in somebody who has um, liver concerns uh, and it just needs a dose adjustment for creatinine clearance of less than three. So um, I talked, we, we kind of briefly talked about stigma. So I'll, I'll probably go through 
uh, these slides a little bit faster as a result. Um, but stigma is the dehumanization of an individual based on their social identity or participation in a negative or undesirable social category. Many of my patients are highly stigmatized um, by the healthcare system. Um, we we discredit them. Uh, we we, we put shame upon them. Um, we often cause humiliation and distress. Uh, and then uh, they lose, they, they, we treat them as though uh, they are discredited. Um, and so we, we don't want to be stigmatizing our patients. And again, stigma, as I mentioned, can come from within, it can come from the healthcare system, it can come from the recovery community, right? There's still this sense in the recovery community that there are, you know, that abstinence is, you know, sometimes the only way, uh, although AA and NA uh, as a national organization says that medication should be encouraged and should not preclude somebody from participating in the program, individual programs still uh, definitely are, um, definitely reflect uh, a, a social structure where there, uh, where there is a discouraging of using medications or that there is a leveling of recovery where somebody who uses medications is not in as good of recovery as somebody else. Um, sorry, my daughter was up vomiting last night and my husband just texted me that she's staying home from school, but he's got to go take the other kid to school. So just kind of navigating parenting right now. My apologies for the awkward pause. Um, healthcare providers, I've already talked about this, but we are the most commonly cited source of stigma. Um, so we don't, you know, you all, you all are like some of the nicest doctors and nicest humans like that are out there. So I know you don't want to be doing this. Um, and so we, you know, I just want to draw your attention to it so that um, you can be kind of aware of the experiences that your patients may have in other spaces. Um, and also that, you know, you create those safe environments by using safer language and just by being um, you know, we're working from a trauma-informed lens. I, I'm sure you all read the, the slide already, but I just want to be clear that this is internationally the most stigmatized um, healthcare issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I end up talking a lot about diabetes and other chronic illnesses um, in general. Um, and so if we had a patient with diabetes who essentially was non-compliant with their with their healthcare recommendations, which happens, you know, pretty regularly um, in primary, in the primary care world, um, we we do, what would happen if we told them that it was their fault? What if would happen if we stopped their medications um, until they went to the nutritionist? What happened? What would happen if we withheld their medication if they lost their insulin if they ran out early? Um, if they, what would happen if we kicked them out of their, uh, out of our offices, if they had, you know, a, a hospitalization related to DKA or, or other episodes of hyperglycemia, we would be, we would be doing malpractice. Um, yeah, with addiction, it's often come in practice um, and we see it, uh, we, we see it happen where these folks are just kind of kicked out of chair, uh, kicked out of care because of their um, substance use disorder. Uh, the two largest um, providers of addiction care are the uh, Veterans Administration um, and then uh, the court systems. Um, so about 80% of people with opioid use disorder become involved in the legal system. Um, and you can see that the number of people that, that are um, currently in correctional control um, for drug offenses uh, has just ballooned over um, the you know over the last forty years, um, reflecting the war on drugs. Um, we could do a whole another conversation about the war on drugs and how that was um, literally made to target um, underserved populations. People who have that cor uh, correctional control. Um, involvement have a lasting impact on their lives, right? They are not able to get student loans. They are uh, they there there are employment challenges, right? The background the the infamous background check, um, and and then uh, they're not eligible for uh, federal housing uh, federal housing support. Um, so they're not eligible for things like Section Eight housing. So it can have a lasting impact for decades. Um, and there are expungement days in Michigan um, where you can get one felony expunged from your record, but it will follow you for decades. It will follow you for the rest of your life, essentially. 
Um, so what are some of the barriers of treatment? Uh, we talked about stigma. Uh, we talked about just kind of that lack of knowledge. Uh, addiction isn't really more complex than other chronic illnesses. It's more that we haven't learned um, in our educational system of in our educational system to become a physician, how to treat it. Um, and then we have just a lack of providers um, in many areas across the United States, clearly with um, more rural areas, uh, more highly impacted than other areas. It wasn't until just a couple of years ago that Michigan's entire Upper Peninsula even had any methadone clinic. And the methadone clinic is right across the bridge in St. Ignace, which means folks over on this side of Michigan, really don't have access. Medicaid dollars do not cross state borders. Uh, so even though there are some bordering methadone clinics, um, uh, our population cannot access them. Um, the next methadone clinic south is in Gaylord, and then we have one in Mount Pleasant. There's not one in Saginaw Bay City area. There is not one in Traverse City, um, Big Rapids area. So those patients usually drive to uh, Mount Pleasant for methadone. There is a law that passed the Senate Health Committee uh, that would allow uh, board-certified um, addiction specialty physicians to prescribe methadone, um, but it is facing some challenges from the 60% for-profit methadone clinic industry. Um, so here are some ways to challenge stigma. Um, you know, speak out when you hear people using unsafe language or, treat, or, or stigmatizing a patient. I think you probably encounter this uh, quite a bit in the hospital-based systems, right? Where they're talking about that patient is drug-seeking or they're talking about that patient um, in kind of those derogatory or negative, uh, negative manners um, and, and uh, just treat people nicely. Um, we, we know that our words matter. Um, we talked a little bit about this, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but um, the, you know, some of these things like the word um, addict and clean uh, drive stigma, we're often learn, we often learn that we should reflect what our patients say. So if our patients say, I'm an addict, we should use the word addict with them. What the evidence in addiction shows is that actually when we, uh, people still prefer person-centered language, um, so they don't want to be called an addict, my patients will come in and say, Dr. Poland, you're going to be so proud of me, my urine's clean. And then they'll pause and they'll go, I know you don't use that word, but that's what it is. Um, because the uh, because the words that we that we want to use are expected and unexpected results. I expect to see the prescribed medications in there. I don't expect to see non-prescribed medications. Um, and and uh, and you know I, I kind of tongue in cheek tell people that the only dirty urine is UTI urine, and I have uh, yet to hear of a provider that calls a patient and says, "Hey, you've got a UTI." <laughs> Your urine is really dirty, so we're going to give you some um, antibiotics to clean that up. We don't say that because that sounds terrible, right? But, you know, it's teeming with bacteria. Isn't that the closest thing to dirty? I mean, heroin itself isn't dirty. Um, so I, you know, I kind of tongue in cheek say that, but you can see where there's just a really big discrepancy between how we think about and talk about substance use disorders compared to how we talk about a UTI. Um, and, and it's not always logical. Uh, and and uh, we, we are moving away from the term recovery, although it still shows up a lot. Uh, patients still use it. We still use it um, in addiction, but we are moving more and more to talking about people uh, being in remission from their disease. Um, and a person as an individual is not clean or dirty based on their drug use. Here are just some things that we can, that we hear, that we can change, that we can think about. Um, the other one that I usually point out is uh, medication-assisted treatment. Um, as I mentioned, the only way to reduce death is medication. So medication isn't assisting treatment. Medication is treatment. Um, so we talk about it as uh, we're going to still use the MAT vernacular. We talk about it as medication for addiction treatment, or we talk about it um, specifically as medications for opioid use disorder, MOUD, or medications for alcohol use disorder, MAUD. Um, it's really not that hard to be an addiction specialist. We went through pretty much every FDA-approved medication other than the ones that are used for nicotine use disorder um, and naloxone, because I kind of assumed you had some experience with that. Um, so there's like, I don't know, five medications, like seven if I include, you know, 10 if I include a uh, nicotine use disorder. Um, so being, it's it's not technically difficult uh, doing the work that I do. It's just that we weren't trained to do it. 
Um, but it's really important to know that like opioid stigma in particular, uh, I pulled this just because I assume that's the largest population that you all are seeing. Although that alcohol statistic was striking, wasn't it? Um, the 28% statistic. Uh, but we also know that we actually feel a lot of guilt and shame regarding how um, we treat these patients. This was a study that was done with nurses. Um, and, and, uh, and it shows just that like, when we feel disempowered, we treat people. Um, we don't tr always treat people as well as we could. Um, and so just having some of this knowledge, hopefully I've helped today um, just to reframe the disease. Um, and I'm always available to help with uh, treatment or other, um, uh, or, or other questions um, because all of our patients um, should have health and treatment, caring conversations, a safe treatment, um, and a feeling of mutual trust and non-judgment with their uh, clinicians. Um, I end all of my talks to all the people who've lost their, lost their lives to addiction and those that try to prevent further losses. Um, there's a myriad of ways to get in touch with me. Um, also happy to share, um, I, think, I think a lot of the uh, Grand Rapids I have my cell phone number, but I will throw it in the chat um, if anybody else would like to uh, reach out that way as well. I just don't put it on like my final slide, but I will pause there. I promise next week when I'm back, I will leave. The talk is shorter, um, so there will be more um, time for discussion, but we have a few minutes before the fellows cases. And uh, I will stop my share to see if there are any questions or thoughts. Well, thanks again, Carol. This is always uh, so uh, enlightening. I mean, I've heard this a number of times and I, I always learn a little bit, something more that either is new or that I've forgotten. You know, my, 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 my brain is at that stage where I don't remember everything. But I appreciate you, uh, you, you, you sharing this. One of the things I just wanted to uh, highlight, you were talking about uh, a, a couple of times about how we as physicians, uh, the things that we're not really trained to do. And with uh, with trends within the um, uh, within our industry to to reduce or eliminate opioid prescribing, especially in primary care offices. But one of the things that I think is uh, uh, it, it, that I think is highlighted through that that I believe we've got the capabilities of doing, but we just haven't really been taught is how to wean people off of opioids um, uh, who shouldn't be on them. And I, I, I know you're probably well aware of um, the, the system in Lansing at uh, Michigan State where they're trying to make it essentially an opioid-free medical center. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I've been arguing for is the fact that you can't really invoke that until you've trained people how to get them off of opioids. Number one, identify the people who should be on opioids those that shouldn't be, and how to get them off. That's not difficult. It's just something that we have to, um, right? We have to be intentional about. Well, and we have so so to so to me, what I often talk about. My husband is a recreational pilot. Apparently, you become a pilot. You like fly airplanes for fun when you marry a physician. This is what I have learned in my life. Um, so he, <laughs> so I always tell people okay. like. Um, you know, my husband didn't just learn to take off the plane and land the plane because I wasn't going to get into the airplane without him knowing what to do in the event of an in-flight emergency, right? Um, and so what you're talking about is the in is, is one version of the in-flight emergency, right? You have somebody who is on chronic opioids and you're like, wait, that was the wrong choice. They now have hyperalgesia. They now have, you know, they now have negative consequences of their opioids. The evidence has changed and we know that, you know, that isn't the best treatment for the, for whatever is the underlying cause of their pain, blah, 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 blah. What are we going to do? We ha you're right. They haven't been trained how to, how to have those conversations. Um, the other in-flight emergency is what to do when it becomes a substance use disorder. Probably about seven or eight years ago, I used to be able to tell people we were like, we've had four waves of the opioid epidemic. I used to be able to tell people like 80.2% um, of people, according to National Survey on Drug Use and Health data, um, started with prescription opioids before they went to, before they went to heroin. Um, again, this is old data, so don't don't quote that anywhere now because um, it's not accurate. Um, but uh, it used to be, you know, it used to be that those chronic opioids were the entry point. And so what we do know is that if we 
inappropriately or don't taper in a patient-centered way, um, we run we run a lot of risk. Um, I, I actually uh, got pulled into that conversation and maybe blew things up because I may have said, you know, okay, so one, we're focusing on opioids. Are we talking about all controlled substances? Because last time I checked, benzodiazepines have no indication for use over two weeks at all, ever, period, end of discussion. So like, help me understand where the evidence is for uh, continuing like benzodiazepines for anxiety for decades. Um, just ask, just asking for a friend. Um, what, where's the conversation around stimulants, like other control, right? Other controlled substances. And, um, you know, we are kind of like in this opioid epidemic. I don't know if you've heard of it, but, uh, where is the expectation for all your primary care physicians, if we're going to go opioid free to have the ca capability and competency to one screen patients currently on opioids two taper people off of opioids three, uh, know how to prescribe and treat a mild to moderate substance use disorder, which is perfectly well within the wheelhouse of primary care, because guess what? Your family medicine residency is doing it. So I know that it's okay and sanctioned by the system. So like, why isn't the internal medicine residency doing it? And why isn't it just a baseline requirement of all of your primary care um, providers? Um, and it, I, it kind of got blown up. So, um, but yes, um, I think the, the key thing is we have to understand and recognize that these are very powerful medications, whatever controlled substance class you're talking about. But if we're looking specifically at opioids, we have to understand and respect their power and coming up with draconian rules. Like we're just never going to do something probably isn't in our patient's best interest. But I did hear from the CMO that uh, palliative care will is, is excluded, that this is mostly geared toward primary care. So hopefully, um, you know, hopefully at least, that, at least that's good. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, we're, you know, they've, uh, they've drawn me into that conversation and I've really been uh, arguing a lot of uh, the points that you make. Um, one of the things that, that really, uh, when I was really kind of going through the list of patients for whom OPRs are a legitimate option, um, their, their, their kind of glib comment was, well, we really don't take care of those patients in our clinics. Um, <laughs> and I thought, this discussion is going to need to go on a little bit yeah. longer before they understand that. So mm -hmm. this is great. And uh, we'll look forward to next week. And uh, awesome. I, I would just, thank uh, you. Yeah. So, so for, for those on the call that will be joining us next week as well, um, I would encourage you to reach out to, uh, to me um, or to Kara or to your program director uh, with any particular uh, issues or topics that you'd like to make sure that Kara can touch upon next week. And she's very, very good about integrating those in to her, uh, to her talk so that if there are some curiosities or questions that you didn't uh, have answered today, but you want to make sure are covered, please let us know so we can get that plugged in. So. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone.